Uh, live from Jackie Robinson Ballpark here in downtown Daytona Beach, Florida. It's time for the first game of a three-game weekend series between the Florida A&M Rattlers and the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats on a busy weekend for Bethune-Cookman University Athletics here in Daytona Beach. Overcast, windy, rain all around us. Thankfully not raining very hard here at the moment, just spitting as we approach game time. It is a rematch of the championship game of the SWAC tournament last year where the Rattlers ultimately felled the Wildcats. This team for the Wildcats, of course, looks a lot different. The team from the Wildcats, Bryce Wynoski, or excuse me, for the Rattlers, looks uh, very much the same except the pitching department. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. And we had a, a really great conversation with head coach Jonathan Hernandez prior to the game tonight, just talking about kind of the rivalry, or in this case, the lack of the rivalry. As much as on paper you look at Florida AM and and Bethune-Cookman, there's juice there. But with so much turnover on this Bethune-Cookman roster and really kind of, I think, a fairly tame championship game from th there wasn't any chippiness. There wasn't any back and forth. Guys weren't going at each other. It's baseball. It's a little bit different than football when you're banging heads with each other or even basketball when you're in the paint with the same guys every possession. This isn't on paper a a as much as a rivalry from the standpoint of bad blood or anything to that respect. And for so many new faces with Bethune-Cookman, you're just trying to take care of business. For seeding purposes, this is a massive series. Definitely the Wildcats want to win or better in this one. But it, it is business as usual for the Wildcats tonight. And that and that starts at the top with head coach Jonathan Hernandez. And it also starts with starting pitcher Tanner Bocabello, the junior out of Tampa, Florida, and a transfer from St. John's River State College. The big righty who comes in with a 297 ERA, 2-0 in five appearances. He's given up 30, 11 runs on 33 hits, 10 earned, struck out 24, walking just five opponents, batting 270 against him. Ty Jackson stands in. He swings and misses at a ball in the dirt, and we are underway. Getting out of the weather, so to speak, in advance, we are all the way down the first base line, huddled under the roof of the party deck here at Jackie Robinson Ballpark because of the threat of imminent rain. Second pitch, a swing and miss. 0-2 oh, on Jackson. So if the descriptions of pitches are a little off tonight, we apologize. But thankfully, you are joining us all the same here on the Cat Eye Network. Bo Cabello trying to get rid of Jackson. Here's the 0-2 up and in. And it's 1-2. and two. The starting pitcher for Florida a and when they tow the rubber in the bottom of the first will be Caleb Granger. And very similar numbers between Bo Cabello and Granger. Bo Cabello misses low and outside 2-2. Two and two. And this maybe of any of the matchups this week is the one that you could circle as the pitcher's duel. Coco Bellows had some, some on, some off so far to start the year. It puts one in the dirt, and from 0-2 ahead, the count's now 3-2. and two. Obviously looked really strong against Mississippi Valley State last weekend, but he, he's had some blips early on. You know, Gulf Coast is another one. Trying to see what the real Tanner Bocabello looks like the further we get into the season. Bocabello, the full count delivery. Hit in the air towards left field, actually towards center field, excuse me, Rivera. Trots in three steps to make the catch one away. Ty Jackson, who is just retired, is the best hitter that Florida A&M has by average. He's batting 375, but he flies out and there's one away. Here's the catcher, Brody Popple, one of the few Florida A&M players that was not on this team last year when they won the SWAC title. First pitch the lefty, squares to bunt, pulls it back, takes his strike. Popple, a 268 hitter, seven runs on 19 hits, five doubles, a homer, 13 ribbies. He does lead the team in doubles. Bo Cabello, righty lefty, the 0 1, big cut miss on the. Like many of the Bethune Cookman starting pitchers that they have to bring to bear, Bo Cabello is at best when he is. Trying to mow guys down into his windup quickly, and he hit him up in the bill of the helmet. So Popple on, and he kind of bails out himself after being down 0-2. And Bocabello has, has not really struggled with being particularly wild to start the season. Walks haven't been a massive issue for him, free passes of any kind. But a guy that should work, should look to work to contact first. Yep. Only the fifth hit by pitch on this season for Boca Bella. One on one out here is John Mikel Bastardo, who ate the Cats alive at the championship game in the SWAC last year. Had a couple of RBI. 
in that game. Takes a pitch low, 1-0. One out here, top of the first with rolling gray clouds all around. Inside and a miss with the fastball, 2-0 from Boca Bella. It's important for the Wildcats to keep this Florida A&M team off of the scoreboard early. The Rattlers, if allowed, can put up a ton of runs. Runner goes, hit in the air, caught on the line at third, skip back to first, not in time to catch Popple as he dives back. But a nice play out there by uh, Peter Vasquez at third base. And Vasquez has been really outstanding there in a couple of games since some injuries have banged up the Wildcats a bit. But hard contact or not for Boca Bello, that just shows you how important it is to work to contact with how good especially this infield has been to start the season for BCU. Of course, Vasquez made a couple of great plays at the hot corner on Tuesday night. First pitch, a strike to Sebastian Greco, another one of the returning SWAC champions. He's hitting 282, 10 runs on 20 hits, four doubles, a triple, a team leading five homers and 16 RBIs. Breaking ball misses outside one and one. Greco is the reigning SWAC hitter of the week. And in the bottom of the first, we'll see Caleb Granger, the reigning SWAC pitcher of the week. As the Rattlers swept both of those awards after a sweep of Alabama A&M last weekend. Boca Bello in his windup. Hit high in the air down the left field line. Going back, Sean. Track, wall. He reaches up with his back pressed against the wall to make the catch and retire the side. So the Wildcats... Give up some hard contact, but no runs, no hits, one left. We go to the bottom of the first, Rattler zero, Wildcats coming back. This is Bethune-Cookman University Baseball on Cat Eye Network Radio. Through the bottom of the first, we go no score here at Jackie Robinson Ballpark. First meeting of the season between the Wildcats and the Rattlers of Florida A&M. They will meet at the very end of the season. Last conference series of the year up in Tallahassee. No, second to last, excuse me, conference series of the year up in Tallahassee. The Wildcats will end at home against Alabama State the 16th through the 18th of May. But that is a long way away. Got plenty of conference play to go as Sergio Rivera leads off for the Wildcats. He is one of the players on this Cats roster swinging a hot bat right now. First pitch in there for a strike from Granger, the reigning swag pitcher of the week. Sebastian Granger, last year as a sophomore for the Rattlers, was 6-5 and five in 19 appearances with a 6.35 ERA, 57 strikeouts and a 175 whip. Counts one and one. Here's the pitch. Swung on and fouled high in the air on the infield left-hand side. The third baseman, Hater Mota, 
steps back to make the catch, one away. And w when you look at a series like this with so much importance seeding-wise for both sides, you know, the Wildcats come off a weekend against Valley. The Rattlers come off a weekend against equally poor Alabama A&M. And so both teams kind of had it easy to start things off. They both took on some tough midweek competition, but we'll see what their change looks like coming into tonight. First pitch in there for a strike to Garrett Chun. One out, nobody on bottom of the first. Chun, a 259 hitter. 11 runs on 21 hits, three doubles, one triple, no homer, 18 ribbies. That's a team high for Garrett. And he takes another strike, and it's 0-2. Granger. Try to get by Garrett Chun quickly into his windup. The righty deals outside. One and two. The Wildcats have mostly got it done with defense as Garrett Shun fouls one off, and we'll see the one-two again. Winning some low-scoring contests in the midweek. Righty lefty, here's the one-two. Ground ball through the left side, over the diving glove of Fontenot at second, and into right field for a base hit. That's kind of hidden right there that made Garrett Chun so successful to open up the season. Such a conduit for offensive success for the Wildcats, as is early base runners. With just one out here, the Wildcats would love nothing more than to make something early happen. We talked about hot bats for the Wildcats. There's nobody hotter than Jose Gonzalez. He's been on base 17 straight games. Now the Wildcats have only played 19 games of the season. And the first pitch to him. Swing on a grounder towards short could be two. Niles flips to second on to first double play, and that ends the inning. Well, Wildcats get a hit, but don't get anything else. No runs, no hits, none left. And we go to the second inning. No score right here on the Cat Eye Network. No scores. We head to the second inning here. Both pitchers give up one base runner, but nothing else in the first as Joseph Perini, who hit a home run against the Wildcats in the SWAC championship game a year ago, grounds it right back to Boca Bello. He'll underhand to Soufrain at first one down. And how many plays at the mound have we seen over the last two, three games? Guys have shown off that they're more than just a pitcher, shown that, that defensive fielding stance right off the mound. Not all of them have been easy. Some great communication in the infield. Another good play right there. Especially Joel Corre on Tuesday against North Florida. He had three spectacular putouts from the mound. First pitch swinging popped high and foul. Third base side out of play from Adam Hittermota. A 293 hitter. 12 runs on 17 hits, five doubles, no triples, two homers, seven ribbies. No on one out, the 0-1 from Boca Bello in there for a strike going two. This Wildcats staff, we talked about it a little bit on Tuesday, is less strikeout focused than they were last year. Of course, losing a guy like Nolan Santos at the top of the rotation cuts down a lot of those strikeouts. Big cut and miss, ball in the dirt. They have to throw down to first to complete the strikeout, and they do. It's two away as Hater Moda goes down swinging. 
And really, that SWAC championship game a year ago is closer to the type of pitching staff that the Wildcats employ this year. Of course, Nolan Santos leads that one off, but isn't 100% of Nolan Santos after the long week, couple of starts. But then you got into Daniel Gaviria and some others who worked to contact first, and Florida AM took advantage. Two down, nobody on here is Jalen Niles. First pitch to him it is a fastball strike down the middle, 0 and 1. Niles, a 250 hitter. 13 runs on 60 hits, 16 hits, excuse me. Two doubles, no other extra base hits, eight ribbies. He hits this one on the ground towards short, covering and firing over. Oh, and Soufrain dropped the ball. It was an excellent play behind second base by Ramsey's Cordova, and the ball just popped out of Soufrain's glove. I'm going to give that one E3. And really a rare, rare error for Manny Soufrain to start the season. He's been really excellent fielding on hops and, and, and leaping for balls, going uh, ranging for things. Just just not what we've been used to seeing so far in this season for him. So the Rattlers get a gift, just like they did in the first inning with the hit by pitch on the air that gives them a run or on first with two down. Here's Ben Kim. They throw over to try and catch Jalen Niles. He slides back in. This is not a hefty stealing team, Florida a and Nobody on their roster with more than three steals. First pitch from Boca Bello outside at high 1-0 to Ben Kim. Kim hitting an even 200. 12 runs on nine hits, one double, two, rib two homers, nine ribbies. And they throw over to first, and Soufrain drops the ball again. I think the runner was kind of in the way there. Might have even nudged the arm of Soufrain when he was trying to make the grab, so maybe not the best throw there. 1-0 pops out of the glove of Rodriguez behind the plate. No harm, no foul call to strike one and one. Wildcats have the case of the dropsies in this second inning. Rain, certainly no excuse for that because it has calmed down. Just a really light sprinkle. Boca Bella winds and fires. Fastball in on the hands, called a strike. One and two, Boca Bella a strike away from getting out of inning number two. Tanner the righty faces Kim the lefty from the stretch deals runner goes throw down to second is in time and the inning is over Rodriguez with a cannon from behind the plate grabs the stealing Niles and we go to the bottom of the second no runs no hits one error and none left and we go to the bottom of the second no score here on the cat eye network To the bottom of the second we go, and Jorge Gonzalez Febo leads off for the Wildcats in a nothing nothing game against Florida AM. He hits one on the ground, a third firing across for the out is Hader Moda. One gone, one swing, one pitch. Briskly played start to this one. We've seen that, I think, the hand, last handful of games where we've just kind of motored through the first three innings or so. Definitely a more aggressive approach, I think, at the plate over the last handful. But, of course, it's something that we lamented a lot last year where the Wildcats just weren't getting rid of starting pitchers because they were being so aggressive and giving pitchers 10-pitch innings, 12-pitch innings, 
First pitch outside to Manny Soufrain, 1 0. In the dirt, 2 0 to Soufrain. And Coach Hernandez has been consistent just about every time he, he steps over here with us. He's saying, well, our goal is to get to the bullpen. Sometimes they swing away like they have so far tonight. Granger works quickly in the air, center field, ranging back. Jackson makes the catch two away. Wind is blowing out to center slash right center. So if that had a little more loft on it, maybe you see a little bit more from that one, but yeah. more of a line drive from Sue Frank. A rare wind blowing out. Usually it's coming in off the water from the, all the weather systems around us. The wind is swirling primarily towards center field. First pitch, a strike to Jorge Rodriguez, the catcher who gunned down the runner to end the top of the inning. Inside corner, strike two. Rodriguez has platooned with Irvin Escobar behind the plate, so he doesn't have a lot of stats. Takes one in the dirt, one and two. Rodriguez hitting 231 in 39 at-bats, lowest in the starting lineup. Seven runs on nine hits, three triples, a homer, and four ribbies. Bases empty, two down. The one-two from Granger. Pounds the ball into the glove, now into his motion. In the dirt again, and it's two and two. Now you talk about getting to the bullpen, and really in these conference series where you can face some suspect bullpens, but there are some really good starting pitchers. Especially two, on the Fridays. The 2-2 two -two swung on, popped high in the air, first baseline. That will go foul behind the Rattler bullpen. Yeah, the Friday night guys, almost across the board, are, are very solid in this league. You know, it can start to get a little dicey, and the, even the Wildcats have been no exception to start this year. Still trying to kind of figure out that Saturday, Sunday, who's going to seize that. There's some legit Friday night guys in this league. 2-2, two, two, two outs. Rodriguez punches this one to the right side, and it gets through past Hater Motor for a base hit. It's a little slow roller that saw the space between Hater Motor and Niles and snuck through there. But that's the perfect kind of AB that will help you get to the bullpen. You know, you work deeper into it, you take a handful of pitches, you make the pitcher work, and then you take what's easy, a ball right through the hole over at shortstop, take your base. The Wildcats now have a runner on first with Two outs for the second straight inning. First pitch, strike at the knees to Ramsey's Cordova, the hero. On Tuesday, hit the solo home run to give the Wildcats the lead and then had the game-winning RBI, a little bloop single down the first baseline in the ninth as he watches strike two down the middle at its 0-2. Cordova started off the year playing third, but some injuries have necessitated his move over to shortstop. The pitch, way outside, one and two. He has done very well at shortstop. Still no score here early on, bottom of the second. One on two down, a long look in from Granger. Now he comes set from the stretch, deals. Ground ball towards the third base side. They go to second, and it's a low throw, but picked out of the dirt by Fontenot, and the inning is over. No runs, one hit, one left for the second straight inning, and we go to the third inning of play. No score between the Cats and the Rattlers here on Cat Eye Network Radio.
Hen Kim leads off the third for Florida A&M in a scoreless game. First of a three-game set between the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats and the Rattlers of Florida A&M here at the Jack. This weekend series, Tanner Bocabello back on the mound. First pitch to Kim in there for a strike at the knees. Umpires today behind the plate is Don Andrews. Brad Polk is at first and Landon Davis over at third. Bocabello deals low and inside one and one. So they worked around the Soufrain error in the top of the second. This one's hit high in the air, but not deep. All the way in comes Chun. He has to range to his left to make the catch. In from left field, one away. As the wind blows me to the wrong page of my scorecard. He's working the contact. She's some easy outs. Just right around 30 pitches for Bocabello so far. Cruising right along. That's an easy recipe to get into the deep innings. And the whole pitch to contact strategy has worked for the Wildcats early on. Swearing to bunt is the nine-hole hitter, True Fontenot. One of the few players on this starting lineup that was not a part of the Rattlers' swack winning efforts last season. Bocabello deals. Fontenot swears to bunt again. He almost looks like a slap hitter in softball, the way he kind of tries to push that. As he leaves the box, it's upstairs. The count is 2 and 0. Fontenot, a 294 hitter, 11 runs on 15 hits, and he hits that one to short. Cordova on one hop, a perfect throw over to first, and there's two away. Let your outfield do some work, let your infield do some work. But yeah, as you said, Mike, this Wildcats team leads the SWAC in ERA so far on the year. A lot of guys use the fastball to set up the off-speed. Bocabello, one of those. We'll start off most hitters with that fastball, and it's a nice way to induce some early swings. Back to the top of the order for Florida A&M. Here's Ty Jackson, breaking ball strike. Oh, and one. Jackson flew out to center field his first time up. Bocabello works quickly. And a breaking ball catches the zone at the knees, and it's 0-2. This Wildcat staff, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier on in the game, is, is very comfortable going fast with nobody on base. Seems like that's when they're in their best rhythm. That one got him. Inside corner with the slider. Strike three looking. And one, two, three, go the Rattlers on the first strikeout of the game for Boca Bello. No runs, no hits, none left. We go to the bottom of the third. Wildcats looking to break through in a scoreless game here on Cat Eye Network Radio. To the bottom of the third we go. Peter Vasquez leads off for the Cats. Scoreless game here at the Jack. First of six meetings this year between the Wildcats and Florida A&M. Caleb Granger still on the mound. He gets a first pitch ball outside to Vasquez. Peter batting 300. Four runs on 12 hits. Two doubles. 
nothing else extra and seven RBI. Watches one go outside two and a. Granger kicks, deals, gets a strike called up and away, and it's two and one. Granger making his sixth start of the season. Gets another strike call, this time inside, two and two. Last time out against Alabama A&M. Here's the pitch. Big swing and a miss at a ball in the dirt. And down goes Vasquez on strikes. As I mentioned last time out against Florida A&M, brilliant. Eight innings, one run on four hits. Struck out six, walked one through 91 pitches. And it's such a difference in pitching style from Boca Pello. Slow, deliberate, takes his time. Not shaking off pitches, but just takes his time. First pitch is strike to Colton Olison. Doesn't have the best of starts offensively to the season. Batting 200, six runs on 10 hits, three doubles, no extra, no other extra basers, and eight RBIs. That one goes low, one and one. Granger kind of bounces, got an interesting little look into the plate, kind of bouncing at his knees before he looks in and makes the throw. Olison lines that one straight to Fontenot at short, who leans to his left to make the catch. And there's two away. No shortage of hard contact from both sides, but neither of these guys, true strikeout pitchers. Granger may be more so than Bocabello, but it's fairly close. So letting the defense do its job. Back to the top of the order, Sergio Rivera popped out on the infield to the third baseman is first time up to lead off the game. He bunts it foul back of the plate. Interesting. Nobody on two outs. Rivera, not the quickest guy on this team. He goes, goes to go for the bunt. Could be maybe threatening the position of the infielders, but I don't think it's the first time we've seen that either. These Wildcats play a little bit of small ball from time to time, let the legs do the work. That when he takes a pitch up above the bill of the helmet, one and one. The other four appearances for Granger wins against Eastern Illinois, two against Grambling State. Here's the pitch. In there for a strike at the knees, one and two. The one loss he had, he went six innings, gave up four runs on five hits against Indiana State. Granger again, a long look in. Now he fires. Breaking ball misses outside and low. Two and two. And he averages between 80 and 95 pitches her appearance, Granger. Ground ball towards third. Deep in the hole, it's short. Niles fields across and got him by half a step. What a great throw by Niles. Deep in the hole, it's short. Throws across his body perfectly on time for the outs. Nothing for the Cats in the third. We head to the fourth. Still tied at zero here on Cat on Network Radio. As we head to the top of the fourth, no score between the Rattlers and the Wildcats. Leading off Brody Popple, who was hit by a pitch and stranded on first in the first inning. First pitch from Boca Bello to the lefty is just a bit high. One and O. Oh.
Fouled straight back. One and one. Popple, the redshirt sophomore from Tallahassee. Playing for his hometown team. As Boca Bello is quickly into his windup for the 1-1. And it's chopped foul towards the first base side. One and two. One strikeout for each pitcher. Actually, correction, two for Boca Bello, one for Granger. Boca Bello got Jackson looking to end the second. This one's grounded towards second. Oleson across to first. One down. It was a nice little pitch mix from Boca Bello there. Started him off with three fastballs. Was clear by the third swing. He couldn't catch up with it. So he threw him a breaking ball in the low part of the zone that forced an early swing that resulted in some really weak contact and an easy play for Colton Olison. Here's Jan Mikel Bastardo, who forced probably the best defensive play out of the Wildcats so far. That line drive that was caught at third by Vasquez. First pitch up and in. Gets a swing and miss from Bastardo. John McKellen Jr. started his career at Alabama A&M, but came over to the Rattlers last year and was rewarded with a SWAC title. Originally out of Fort Myers, Florida. Here's the 1-1. Big cut miss and a fastball in on the hands, and it's 1-2. Starter's got one of the more closed stances you'll see. Makes it tough to catch up with high heat like that. Bocabello looks in and deals. Outside, one, or sorry, two and two. Wildcats tonight in their all blue, powder blue alternates, reminiscent of the 70s Phillies look. I suppose the Phillies have that as an alternate still today. Breaking ball, strike three, got the start of looking. He's really settled in a groove here as Boca Bello. He's done it both ways. He's starting to feature in the strikeouts a little bit more. He's worked to contact. He's really could be in for a long night if it continues this way. Now Sebastian Greco, who flied out to left his first time. That was end of the first. He's made the best contact of anybody. First pitch inside and low ball one that missed a home run by maybe two or three feet down the left field line. Garrett Chun was at his back pressed up against the wall when he made the catch. Here's the 1-0. Fouled straight back to the screen and it's 1-1. Greco, 10 runs on 20 hits, four doubles, a triple, a team leading five homers. Breaking ball in the dirt, two and one. You can tell Bocabello being very careful with Sebastian Greco, the graduate student out of Tampa. Misses again, three and one. Fortunately, you can afford to be a little generous when you've worked two quick outs, but certainly don't want to get in the habit of allowing two out base runners, especially the way the two out runs have haunted VCU to start the season. Greco hits it high in the air, left field line. That will go foul and hit off the top of the clubhouse. And it's 3-2 full count. Greco started his collegiate career in the A-Sun at Eastern Kentucky. Would that have been before they were in the Atlantic Sun? That might have been the year before they joined the conference, but it was close. Right might have to do time. some digging between the innings. Here's the 3-2 in the air. Left side again. This time it's not going to go as deep as it did last time. Chun tracks it down, and 1-2-3 go. The Rattlers in the fourth. We head to the bottom of the inning. Still no score here on Cat Eye Network Radio.
Garrett Chun, who made the last out of the top of the fourth, will lead off the bottom of the inning at the plate for the Wildcats. He watches a pitch up by his visor, 1-0 from Caleb Granger, starting his fourth inning of work. Big cut and miss from Sean on a fastball, 1-1. One one. So despite working around the two dribbling base hits through the infield, Granger has been pretty much unopposed so far. He does that long look in, now into his windup. Sean high in the air, left field side, moving over Kim. He makes the catch in foul territory behind the BCU bullpen, and there's one down. Rain is definitely starting to pick up now. You can see it out on the field. Coming down a little more steady. Still, I would say, light overall. It's not like it's pouring, but it's it's certainly picked up. Here's Jose Gonzalez grounded into a double play that ended the first inning. His first time up. First pitch swinging. Smacks this one to left field, but Kim just steps in, makes the catch two away on three pitches. Just a tiny bit under that was Gonzalez. Nice contact. Impressive, really, that he got it that far. You could hear the contact off contact off the bat was pretty weak but it out nonetheless and a quick one yeah two outs and three pitches and again we harp on it trying to get to the bullpen that's not the way to do it especially against a guy like Granger who's gone 80 90 pitches every time he stepped on the mound first pitch to Jorge Gonzalez Fabo is a strike inside corner 0 and 1 Fabo was first pitch swinging popped out his first time up quick and grounded out to third and he watches another strike in. And it's so too. Quickly goes Granger, skips one to the plate, cricket style, one and two. And when the weather does start to be a factor like this, that's when you really want to be patient and avoid the quick outs because now you're forcing it into the pitcher's hand who's got to make a much tougher job out of it when he's got to deal with a wet ball. Two outs already in the inning. Here's the one, two. Check swing. He did not go as the ball was in the dirt. Long hold from first base umpire Brad Polk. But the count is two and two. Granger trying to get out of the inning. Righty to righty, here's the pitch. Big swing and miss, jammed him up at the fastball inside corner. The Wildcats go quickly. One, two, three in the fourth. We head to the fifth. This game is motoring along. No score here on Tata Network Radio. We go to the fifth inning. Joseph Pierini leads off, grounded out back to the pitcher Boca Bello in the second for his first plate appearance. First pitch in there, strike one. Still no score here at the Jack, and we have worked quickly through four innings. And there's a pitch low, one and one. Just 45 minutes from first pitch. The rain has slowed once again, back to that light rain that we started with, so no threat there. Big swing and miss from Pierini at a ball in the dirt, one and two. Pierini may be the, the shortest Division One baseball player I've ever seen. He's not much taller than me, 
Very squatty stance in the box, too. Doesn't do him any favors. Grounded softly towards third. Cordova to his left. Cross the diamond in time. One down. Correction, that was Vasquez that made the play. So Pierini's made soft contact twice and grounded out twice. And here's Adam Hader Moda that was the first Bocabello strikeout victim back in the second. And he smacks that one over the leaping glove of Olison and into right field for a base hit. He's going to go to second. Here's the relay throw. It's not in time. And it's a double for Adam Hader Moda. First hit of the game for Florida AM. And fortunate that it wasn't three bases are the Wildcats. Gonzalez Fabo out in right field, bobbled that ball, kicked off of his glove, but luckily it bounced right to his offhand, and he was able to corral it and throw it in. And the sharpest bit of contact we've seen off of Boca Bello as well. That was rocketed. Olison tried to get there, but again, he's not that tall either. Maybe if he had six more inches, he might have had a shot at it. Breaking ball, first pitch strike to Jalen Niles, who reached on a Manny Soufrain error in the second, was stranded there. Actually caught stealing there, excuse me. That ended that inning. Niles, big cut and miss, late on the slider, 0-2. Now, with a runner on second, we'll see how much Bocabello's rhythm is affected. He's been mowing through these FAMU hitters. Big cut, this strike three, as down goes Niles. The rhythm, I think, is the most important thing when you talk about being affected by base runners. Guys will throw over. We've seen plenty of that this year, but it's keeping that up-tempo pace and not letting it slow you down that has been so vital for so many arms on this staff for the Wildcats. Here's Ben Kim. Flew out to left his first time up, and he's made a couple of plays in the field at that left field position. First pitch, a ball outside and high 1-0. and oh. On a blustery, blustery day, Kim pops this one up. Foul, first base side, that'll hit the seats. Look out, people in the stands. Hey, nice little crowd here tonight, considering the weather, considering how gloomy it's been all day. Considering there's basketball on. <laughs> Florida a &M always travels pretty well. I can't tell from here what the distribution of the crowd is, but not a bad trip down here for a weekend or a day of baseball. The 1-1. One, one. In there for a strike at the letters, and it is 1-2. Boca Bello a strike away from working around the double. Kim, the lefty, asked for time, now steps back in. Bocabello stares him down, throws. It was a pitch out trying to get Hater Moda going. He was almost caught halfway between second and third, but he's able to scramble back to second, two and two the count. Adam Hater Moda after the double being very aggressive on the base pass. Bocabello deals. Big swing and a miss. Got him with the upstairs fastball, and that ends the inning. No runs, one hit, one left. And we go to the bottom of the fifth. No score between the Cats and the Rattlers here on Cat Eye Network Radio.
through the bottom of the fifth we go. No score here at Jackie Robinson Ballpark. Manny Soufrain stands in. Flyed out to center his first time up. Made decent contact, just got a little bit under it. First pitch low, ball one. We were talking during the break about March Madness, as one does. And, of course, Grambling State, the SWAC representative on that side. Another ball low, 2-0. Plays tonight against Purdue after winning their first four game against Montana State in pretty epic fashion. Fun team out there. There's one right down the middle from Granger, two and one. It's always one of those things you can rest your hat on a little bit. I mean, it's kind of loser talk, but to say, you know, we, we lost to the eventual SWAC champions and put up a fight. Soufrain hits another one in the air to center. Going back, Jackson. Track, wall, it's off the wall. Soufrain digging for second. He'll be in there with a stand-up lead-off double. And that's what happens when Soufrain can get a hold of one and put it up there in the jet stream. Yeah, all it took was, like I said last time, just get a little more underneath that ball, put a little more height into it, and the wind will carry it. Carry it all the way off the wall, and absolutely nothing that Jackson can do out there in center field to get it. Now, Jorge Rodriguez, the catcher, has one of the only other two hits for the Wildcats of the game. Singled in the second, but was caught out on the base paths as part of a Ramsey's Cordova fielder's choice to end that inning. And there'll be a meeting of minds on the mound. And a good enough chance as any to talk about some more postseason basketball. The Wildcats, Bethune-Cookman season will roll on for at least one more day tomorrow. They're in the College Basketball Invitational just down the street, just over the bridge from us at the Ocean Center. That game is set to tip off at 1 o'clock tomorrow. That'll be BCU versus Arkansas State, the runner-up to James Madison in the Sun Belt. And if you like offense, that might be the game to watch. Both of those teams averaging over 75 points a game. Takes just eight bucks down there. Come on down. Pack that place out. Let them hear your Wildcat pride tomorrow down there at the Ocean Center. Or if you're further afield, you can catch it live on Cat Eye Network Radio. First pitch fouled straight back from Rodriguez after the meeting on the mound concludes. The entire infield was in there for Florida a &M. Soufrain on second after a leadoff double that missed a home run by maybe a foot. And that one's low and outside. Soufrain not really a stealing threat, especially second to third. He's the one guy, maybe in this entire roster for Bethune-Cookman, that I would call power-focused first. Instead of trying to be a more finesse-style hitter. Breaking ball, low, two and one. Well, I think Gonzalez Febo has probably tried to be power-first. So he should probably adapt into more of a well-rounded hitter. He's definitely been swinging for the fences after that, especially after yeah. the first game of the season. Took the second pitch he saw deep to left field for a home run. The 2-1 to Rodriguez. Got the call inside corner, 2-2. Two and two. And the BCU bench does not agree. Rodriguez singled. Little seeing-eye ground ball to the left-hand side of the second. Here's the 2-2, swung and grounded towards second. They go to third to get the lead runner, and Soufrain is safe. He slides in under the tag, and there's runners on the corners with nobody out. Soufrain showing off the wheels a little bit, got a great jump over there at second base, was in ahead of the throw over there, much to the frustration of the FAMU bench. But now Jamie Shoup is... Out to argue his case. It looked like the ball got there well ahead of Soufrain, just the tag not applied in time by Adam Hader Moda. And of course, no review available here at the Jack today. Or really ever. <laughs> in most places in this conference, it's not something that's accessible, which made it particularly interesting last year, I think, in the SWAC tournament where a lot of coaches were like, oh, we get to review plays now? Look at. Let's review oh, everything. We have access to. Absolutely. <laughs> and there were certain things reviewed that maybe shouldn't have been. Anyway, runners on the corners, and here's Ramsey's Cordova. The hero from Tuesday night swings and misses at a fastball low and in 0 and 1. And you can tell he is trying to continue that mindset of being the hero. Because that maybe was not the pitch to swing at. 
Granger deals. Stepped off the catcher's mask of Popple and its own tune. Now, do you think, I, I, I had thought about this a little bit with runners on the corners, maybe try and bunt, play some small ball, force them to make a throw, have the runner come in from third, but it's Manny Soufrain on third base. I think if it was anybody else, you might see that. Cordova swings, fouls it straight back onto Orange Avenue. And the count holds 0-2. Quite literally anybody else. The only two guys, well, there's three guys in, in this roster, that in this lineup, that don't have a steal on the season, but almost all of them, I feel like, have been involved in some sort of play on the base pass like that. In the dirt, 1-2, and two, runner goes to second. No throw from Popo behind the plate, so they tried the double steal, but Florida A&M wise to it, and Rodriguez will take second base. Might be the first time this season I feel like we've seen teams actually be wise to that attempt. It's worked so many times, but at this point it's got to be something that's been scouted by these teams and figured out exactly what BCU is trying to do. The 2-1 in the dirt, and a great job by Popple to prevent that one from going to the backstop. 2-2 two and two now. Runners on second and third, nobody out. The opening double by Soufrain, the fielder's choice, where the tag was late at third base, and then the steal from Rodriguez. Granger to Cordova, ground ball. On to third, and they've got Rodriguez in a rundown. Soufrain scores. Out at second is Rodriguez. So it's a fielder's choice for Cordova. He'll get the RBI, one nothing Bethune-Cookman. And that's where the attempted double steal is in your favor, especially when there were no outs to start the inning because you're awarded second base because FAMU knows if they try to get the runner, they'll how, end how, up scoring How am I scoring that one? Six, five, four, I think. I'll have to re-go through it in my head. Ground ball up the middle right back to the pitcher, but everybody is safe because the ball caromed off of Granger's leg and nobody had a play on it. Did they call it a foul ball? That was first pitch swinging from Peter Vasquez. No, he's safe at first. I'm going to give that a base hit. Yeah, but that's just a tough luck one. Not a whole lot you can do because even the fastest reflexes from Granger there aren't going to do a whole lot to stop a ball. Hit that hard right back at the lower half of your body. But again, the Wildcats avoid the double play when they're gifted second on the, you know, kind of catch them sleeping. So now you still only one out here. First and second. And we're back to the bottom of the order. Colton Olison, first pitch, strike to him 0 and 1. This would be a great time for Colton to break out of that little slump he's been on. Pitch from Granger. He'll bunt, pull it back, and it's a strike anyway, 0 and 2. Still one down. Cordova and Vasquez on second and first, respectively. Count is 0 and 2. And time is called. By hitting coach Derek Cartayas, he wants to talk to Colton Olison. And Olison's been in the college game for long enough that him and Cartaya could almost be peers. Cartaya was a graduate assistant down at FIU recently before coming over to BCU. And Olson's a guy who's so quick, always has been so quick to take advice like that, to ask questions of the coaching staff, to try to build that more all-around hitter, trying to become a better player. He's got all the makings of a leader in that respect. Cartaya so prepared at the hitching, hitting coach spot. First and second, one out. 0-2 to Olison. Granger deals. Colton swings and misses at a ball in the dirt strike three. And there's two down. I don't necessarily think that was the plan after that meeting, you know, going first pitch swing, but that was one that I think Olison thought better of. Had a, had a chance to, you know, slice one over the infield, but just got, got by him a little too quickly. Back to the top of the order, Sergio Rivera once again. First and second, now two down. One already in in the inning. Breaking ball, first pitch, strike. Slider finds the zone. Rivera has popped out in the first and grounded out in the third as his two plate appearances. And Granger, after a long look in, deals. Check swing, did he go? No, pitch goes low. 
And it's 1-1. One one. Rivera on the season. One of four Wildcats with double-digit RBI. Sitting at 10 right now. Love to add one or maybe even two to his tally right here. Here's the 1-1. One one. Ground ball, third base side. Hater Moda has trouble with it, goes to second, and everybody's safe. The ball skipped right under the glove of Hater Moda. He had to field it barehanded between his legs, and by the time he threw to second base, Vasquez was already there. It's Cordova's on third, Vasquez on second, and the third fielder's choice of the inning puts Rivera on first. Fort AM, a &M another strong infielding team. Not often you see a play like that. It eats them up a little bit over the hot corner, and the Wildcats take advantage, as they always seem to do. Base is loaded two out. Here is the RBI leader on this Bethune-Cookman team, Garrett Chun. First pitch low and inside, ball one. The wind has really picked up in the last minute or so, gusting hard out towards center field. One in the air and see what happens. The pitch. Outside and low, 2-0. and oh. And if you're Sean here, do, do you even offer before you get a strike call? With how deep this Wildcats lineup is, even directly behind Garrett Chun, absolutely not. Use that protection to your advantage. Granger works a little bit quickly here out of the stretch. Fires one right at the belt. Two and one the count. Two outs, bases loaded. Wildcats try to add to their one nothing lead already. The righty Granger against the lefty Chun. He winds and fires. It is low ball three. And another nice job by Popple behind the plate as that one almost skipped out of his glove. Got to be careful now with Ramsey's Cordova at third. The 3-1. A ball puts another run in for the Wildcats. Granger deals, swing, and a line drive, base hit over the second baseman's glove and into right field. Cordova scores, rounding third, and coming home is Peter Vasquez. He scores. The ball it gets away. Going to second is Garrett Sean. It's a two RBI single plus an advancement on a bad throw. Three to one, Bethune Cookman. Or three nothing, excuse me, Bethune Cookman. Chun is rewarded there off. Being patient, waiting for his pitch, forced Granger into a bad position, leaves one over the middle, and taking the other way pretty easily. And some nice heads-up base running there from Chun to take second. I'm surprised that Cordova maybe didn't try to go home, but maybe too, too long of a run for him to try to make that happen. But now, still very, very dangerous with two guys in scoring position. Here is Jose Gonzalez. First pitch, swinging ground ball up the middle, deep in the hole, fielded by Fontenot, long throw to first. He's safe! Another run scores, and there's runners at the corners with two down. And that is the very rare, especially in today's game and, and, and athletic training the way it is now and all the, the, the way the mentality for coaches has changed, slide, head first slide into first base. It's one of those debates we have through sports. Anytime someone gets injured is, is well, is it even any faster? But that's, that's a prime example of selling out for your team, giving it your all, making that last bit of hustle, and in this case, it's rewarded with an RBI. Here's Jorge Gonzalez Fabo, excuse me, who grounded out in the second, struck out on the fourth. Runners on the corners and now caught in a rundown as they tried the double steal is uh, Gonzalez, and he's out. So an inauspicious end, but four runs. One, two, three hits, four hits maybe? I'm not sure what's been called a hit, what's been called a fielder's choice. Well, anyway, the Wildcats get four runs. Four runs, five hits, one error, and one left. And we go to the sixth inning. The Wildcats have broken this one open. They lead 4 nothing here on Cat Eye Network Radio.
quickly to the top of the sixth we go here at Jackie Robinson Ballpark, and we almost didn't have time to tally up the results of that last half inning. True Fontenot lifts one in the air, first pitch swinging down the right field line, moving over Fabo, makes the catch one away. Big spot for Boca Bello in this inning. You finally got the four runs behind you. Don't let it get to you. Continue to cruise. Continue to work to your defense, even after the long sit. He's had the recipe for success early. FAMU's given him the chance with how much swinging they've been doing. Stay on it. Yeah, and apologies. We are down the first base line, past the first base bag, about even with the FAMU bullpen. First pitch low to Ty Jackson, back to the top of the order for Florida a &M. so it is very dark <laughs> back here. There's no lights on. Big swing and miss, and it's one and one. So trying to write my scorecard is a little difficult. Jackson is over two, flew out to center in the first, and struck out looking in the third, and one bounce to the plate, two and one from Boca Bello. And you, you mentioned this one, right? And how much, how many pitches is Boca Bello up? Sitting just around 65. It's been very efficient. Of course, that helps when there's only been one hit the other way. High fly ball, right field. Fabo moving over. is actually called off by Rivera, who makes the catch. And there's two down. So many first and second pitches swinging for FAMU. They, they really haven't had hardly anybody show the tendency to sit back and wait for their pitch. Very few first pitches taken overall. That was an interesting little dynamic between Fabo and Rivera. It looked like it was going right at Jorge Gonzalez Fabo, but Rivera moved all the way over from center and called him off to make the catch. First pitch from Boca Bella to Brody Popple is upstairs ball one. Popple was hit by a pitch in the first and then grounded out to second in the fourth. Want to know? Boca Bella moving quickly. Big swing and a miss at a fastball low in the dirt. One or one. And this, with the fear of, of jinxing it, is maybe the best we've seen Vocabello look all early season. Breaking ball catches the outside corner. That slider has really developed well over the first month or so of this season. And the fastball is fine in the zone early, and it gives him an opportunity to set up off speed. Vocabello can be deadly. Here's the pitch. Fouled straight back to the screen. Popple stays alive. Brody Popple's done a yeoman's work behind the plate as well to save a couple of runs even though the Wildcats got four in that last inning could have been more if he didn't stop a couple from going to the backstop pitch way upstairs reaching up above his head to get it as Rodriguez and it's two and two completely missed his spot that time that's one as a pitcher you just gotta put behind you move on to the next pitch two 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 out Bocabello deals just got a piece of it did Popple and fouled it straight back Went to that breaking ball to try and get this to strike down. Boca Bello from the stretch. High in the air, straight up left side. Rodriguez moving over, and it's into the BCU dugout. No play on it for the catcher. Not sure you ever had it trapped up in the air. You could hear some of the infield guys calling him, trying to Explain the situation, try to give him a little bit of direction, but couldn't come up with it. Three straight foul balls for Popple, and he's stayed alive in this A-B, and all of them have been late swings where he's barely caught up to him. Bocabello checks his wrist, trying to get out of this inning. One, two, three, after the Wildcats put up a full spot in the bottom of the fifth pitch. Ground ball towards second. Olison fields on a hop, sidearms it to first in time. One, two, three, goes Florida a and and we go to the bottom of the sixth for nothing. Bethune Cookman right here on Cat Eye Network Radio.
Jorge Gonzalez Fabo leads things off for the Wildcats here in the bottom of the sixth. Bethune Cookman trying to add to their four to nothing lead after they put up a four spot in the fifth, and eight batters came to the plate in that inning. Granger still on the mound for Florida AM. Nobody throwing in the Rattler bullpen. Fabo squares to Bunt, drops it down right back to the pitcher. And Granger throws to first. It pulls Greco off the bag, but right into the arms of Gonzalez Fabo, who tags him out. Not a play that went according to plan, but a nice bit of composure there from Greco is able to make the out there. The, the Rattlers really made their life difficult in the last inning with some interesting plays in the field, whether it's not getting the force outs or some poor throws in from the outfield and almost another mistake there. First pitch, a strike to Manny Soufrain, who started the last inning off with a double. Breaking ball finds the zone at the knee zone in two. And I'm sure Granger wants to see the back end of Manny Soufrain. Quickly into the windup for the 0-2. In the dirt, 1-2. and two. And when the defense isn't clicking for FAMU, just in the same way it is for BCU, you're in a lot of trouble because these two teams are built in a very similar way. Two very similar mentalities at the head coaching spot. Pitching and defense. So when one of those isn't doing its share of the weight, it can be a long night. Outside, Tufrain stays alive, 2-2 two and two the count. And Jamie Shoup. Head coach of Florida A&M has been there for quite some time. Coach Shoup all the way back to the MEAC days. Pitch. Soufrain doesn't offer it a breaking ball that ends up hitting the plate. And from 0-2, he's worked it all the way back to a full count. Granger winds, fires. Soufrain watches strike three, and he knew it too. Leans back and walks back to the dugout. And here's George Rodriguez, singled in the second, reached on a fielder's choice in the fifth, and was caught in a rundown between second and third. Two of the three outs that the Wildcats had in that inning were rundowns. Ground ball foul outside of third, and it's 0-1. That double steal has been such a big factor in this Wildcats offense. It's interesting. It's just, it's just a, little, a little different than... Normal, even giving up the last out of the inning of, of the last time out was an interesting call. Ground ball, third base side foul again. It was this one was closer to fair territory than the first one, but still foul as he's been ahead of two straight pitches as Jorge Rodriguez. Big swing and miss and a garbage pitch in the dirt. The catcher will actually run and tag him out instead of throwing to first to end the inning. Nothing doing for the Cats in the sixth. They take a 4-0 lead to the seventh right here on Cat Eye Network Radio. Tanner Bocabello remains on the hill for Bethune-Cookman as we begin the seventh inning. It's been pretty darn efficient so far. Just a one-hitter. Only allowed three base runners, a hit by pitch and an error, and then, of course, the double by Hader Moda. But other than that, it's been pretty solid. 
just showed so much composure working around guys on the base pass when it's when it's been necessary. A little bit of everything has been working. It's gone to the strikeout. It's gone to his defense. So steady. This is exactly the kind of outing you expect from a guy that's been tabbed the Friday nighter all year. First pitch, swinging a ground ball. Fair. It rolls back. Fair. Manny Soufrain tags out Jan Mikel Bastardo one down. We have seen some odd plays over here on the first base. Now, you don't know what you're going to see when you stand all the way over here. Yeah, we get a nice little angle at that ball that started off with some, some curve on it, a little bit of spin when it's on the ground, rolls from foul territory just back into fair. Manny Soufrain, the second that it rolls back fair, gobbles it up for the out. A good old 3U after we saw a 2U to end the last inning. Now here's Sebastian Greco, two fly balls. He bunts this one. Bocabello quickly off the mound to throw him out. Two pitches, two outs for Bocabello. And Florida A&M has absolutely shot themselves in the foot all night with this kind of approach at the plate. It's it's in many ways how we saw the Wildcats get themselves in trouble so much, particularly last year. It's especially this late in the game when you've let Bocabello get this far. You've let him cruise, just continuing to feed into his hand. And now you're risking damage in your play for the rest of the weekend, letting the bullpen sit. First pitch, a breaking ball strike to Joseph Pierini. Pierini, two ground bounce in the game, one in the second to the pitcher, one in the fifth to third. And he's behind 0-1, Bocabello. Swing from Pierini, lifts it foul into the grandstands on the left-hand side. And Bocabello, a strike away here from getting a very quick inning. He stares down Pierini into his windup. Strike three. Got him looking at a pitch that was right down the middle. A five-pitch inning from Tanner Bocabello. And we go to the bottom of the seventh. Four-nothing Bethune-Cookman here on Cat on Network Radio. New pitcher for Florida A&M as we head to the bottom of the seventh inning. It's the junior out of Rockmart, Georgia, Cody Williams. And that retires the starting pitcher, Caleb Granger, in one of his shortest outings of the season. Yeah, absolutely. For Granger tonight, just 84 pitches thrown overall in six innings. He allowed four runs. Only one of them goes in as earned on seven hits. No walks, did strike out five. So not not an ideal start, but certainly didn't get any shelled by any means. Just a, 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 a suffered one bad inning. And was let down by his defense for the most part. Yes, the double by Soufrain was big, but a couple of defensive miscues, especially on the infield, that allowed the Wildcats to score four runs in that frame. 
first batter to face Williams is Ramsey's Cordova. Strike fastball right down the middle. And it's so and one. Williams on the season, making only his second appearance. Fastball fouled straight back 0 and 2 to Cordova. Oh, actually, I was on the wrong page. He's making his uh, 11th appearance of the season. In 10 and 2 thirds innings, I'll finish his stat line after this 0 2 to Cordova. Long look in from Williams, the righty. Now he steps off and looks to the dugout to get some instructions from his pitching coach. Give him a sequence of numbers for the old pitch com on the arm. Definitely different than the old reset of signs. And he got him. Fastball down the middle, strike three, looking for Cordova. First batter retired by Williams. On the season, 10 and two-thirds innings, he's allowed 13 runs on 16 hits, nine earned, 13 strikeouts, eight walks. He's given up two doubles, no triples, one homer, and opponents, I don't know, uh, he's at a 759 ERA. Doesn't have opponent batting average on this page. First pitch, breaking ball, strike to Peter Vasquez. Vasquez struck out in the third, singled, and came around to score in the fifth. He was the second of the four runs scored by Bethune-Cookman in the inning. Second pitch to him, the 0-1, laced, fair ball down the third baseline, and it's a base hit for Vasquez, his second of the game. Cody Williams, clearly after you go through his stats there, a guy that's no stranger to the base runner. He's got the, the whip would be up pretty high after allowing all those through his start to the season. So the Wildcats putting that pressure on early, forcing him to work under some pressure. He's 1-0. Doesn't have any starts. All his appearances are in relief. Got the win as they check over to first. Vasquez slides in safely. The batter is Colton Olison. They got the win in an, uh, only a two and thir two thirds of an inning appearance on the 23rd of February against Grambling State. And Williams rocks and fires. First pitch to Olison as a slider catches the outside part of the plate. 0 and 1. And if you're the Wildcats, you preach get into the bullpen, and now you've gone to the bullpen. Let's see what, what the bats have. A one to Olison. Another strike at the knees. That's two pitches, the exact same location, and Olison didn't offer at either of them. Well, you make a good point. That is a, something we don't mention a whole lot, but when your message is going to be, let's get to the bullpen, well, you've got to then succeed against said bullpen. Wildcats have done that so far this year. 0-2, oh, Olison reaches at strike three in the dirt. And Olison is 0 for three with two strikeouts tonight. And it's back to the top of the order. One down, runner aboard for Sergio Rivera. Rivera popped out on the infield in the first. Grounded out to the shortstop in the third, and then singled and scored in the fifth. And he watches a first pitch strike. It's that same breaking ball that tails away from the right-handed hitters from the right-handed pitcher, Williams. He's thrown that pretty much every time. The 0-1. Check swing, got a piece of it. And it's so and two. I did not see that Vasquez took second, but he has at some point. So I guess I'll give him a stolen base. <laughs> it's very odd watching Williams between pitches because he doesn't look at his catcher like traditional. He's looking right at his head coach, right at his pitching coach every single time. They're relaying the signs or the numbers from there. In the dirt, another great job by Pop uh, Popple, excuse me, behind the plate to prevent Vasquez from going to third. Runner on second, two down. Here in the bottom of the seventh, Wildcats trying to protect a 4 nothing lead and add to it. Williams is 1-2. Rivera watches another one low, 2-2. Two and two. We talked about Soufrane maybe not being the guy that you want on the ba leading the base paths. Peter Vasquez is somebody that you very much do want leading on the base paths. A speedy guy. 
2-2. Gets to the backstop, but it hit Rivera along the way, so he will take first base. I didn't see that, but of course, we're all the way down the first base line. You can hear it just a little bit tip the, I guess the elbow guard, the upper arm guard. Now here's Garrett Chun. Had a two-run single in the fifth. Singled in the first and was caught in a double play and then flew out to left in the fourth. And once again, there will be a meeting of the minds on the mound, the entire infield for Florida A&M there, as well as head coach Jeremy Shoup. And that looks like it's going to do it. Quick night, quick hook for Cody Williams. And we will get another new pitcher. Looks like Josh Scrag. Yep. Graduate student out of Groveland, Florida. And a transfer from Lake Sumter State. So Williams goes two-thirds of an inning and is responsible for both base runners at first and second should they come around to score. And we have a little bit of a break here as Scrag warms up. For those SWAC fans in general, Grambling State, Purdue in action, looking for a little Cinderella magic are the Tigers, SWAC champions. They're currently trailing 29 to 17, about midway through the first half. Zach Eaton kind of doing his thing against them. Soon to be player of the year, 14 early points for him. But of course, if you're Bethune-Cookman now with Florida a &M already on their third pitcher here in the seventh in this first game of a three-game series, if, if you're Coach Hernandez, you've got to be pleased, right? Because Bocavello's been strong, and maybe you go to your bullpen for the eighth or ninth, or maybe you leave Tanner out there, who knows? But to see three arms for FAMU to chase their best starter with four, a four-run lead, it's it's been good so far. No doubt it's a message coming into a weekend like this. I think the ideal for Coach Hernandez would be to take Bocavello all the way through the eighth and have potentially Pablo Torres close it in the ninth. But who knows if Boca Bello continues to look as strong and if really Florida a and continues to give him the opportunity to go deeper, you may leave him in for the whole thing. But this is a, a, a great start to a weekend. This is exactly how you picture your ideal start going in is working that bullpen and working it hard. There's already another arm up in the FAMU bullpen in the form of Josue Figueroa, as things go flying off of our table as the wind picks up again. First pitch away outside to Garrett Shun from the right-handed pitcher Scrag. I'll get you his numbers momentarily. Scrag, remember, a graduate student from Groveland, transfer from Lake Sumter State. You ever been to Groveland, Mike? I don't think so. Here's the pitch. It's low from the lefty. This is the first lefty pitcher the Rattlers have thrown this evening. He's got that kind of that sidearm delivery. The count is 2-0 and on Garrett Chun. Seems like what, from what I remember last year, it seems like every SWAC bullpen is good for one or at least one sidearm or unorthodox arm. Breaking ball breaks way early. 3-0, and one in the dirt. And again, Garrett Chun, he had a, a, an at-bat like this last time. We were up 3-0 and eventually got the two RBI single his last time at bat. But I'm going to say it again. If I'm Garrett Chun, I'm not swinging. I am, I'm not taking the ball off the bat. This pitch, oh, come on. I'm not taking the bat off my shoulder, excuse me. This pitcher has not shown that he's been capable of throwing strikes. Let him walk me. And maybe more so than anything at this point, it's an effort to continue to push that bullpen a little bit more. You don't need to try to make something happen and, and risk running into and out when you could just sit on a couple of pitches, be very patient with it, and continue to make them sweat down there over the mound as arms continue to show some action in the FAMU bullpen. They're not done yet. Two outs in the inning. Vasquez at second after a single and stolen base. Rivera on first after a hit by pitch. Chun ahead in the count 3-0 and oh after a quick meeting on the mound between catcher and pitcher. The pitch. Inside ball four, bases juiced for Jose Gonzalez. Disaster very much looming for Florida a &M. You put a couple of runs through here, you're and almost to the point. This that, might be it. 
for another pitcher as here comes the coaching staff again. Another trip to the mound for Jamie Shoup as he prays for somebody to come out of that bullpen and get them out of this inning. It's, it astounds me the Wildcats have not got a run across yet. And we're going to see another pitcher. Just one batter faced for Scrag, and he's done. Just the walk to Chun to load the bases, and Coach Shoup has seen enough. And and the hook has been so quick. You know, you talk about working the bullpen, but the last two guys to take to play, Williams and now Scrag, you could very well still see, late, especially with Scrag, later in this weekend. Could be one where, hey, it's an off night, maybe the wind, maybe whatever is ailing you. It's, it's not been your night, but we'll see you again on, on Saturday. We'll see you again on Sunday. But Wildcats still very much doing their job and, and putting their bats in a position to succeed. Now you put a couple of crooked numbers on the board here. You put two, three more. Might see fam you all but concede this. I thought we might start to see that a little bit. I mean, you, you don't ever concede a conference game. You know, really, a coach will definitely never tell you that. But with two more against your rival, against one of your biggest opponents in the conference still to go this weekend. You don't want to burn things too bad. You may just let a guy try to figure it out, get through it. But here we go, taking the opposite approach, another bullpen arm for the Rattlers. Andrew Ginter is the new pitcher, the senior from Monticello in Georgia on the season, making his eighth appearance, 15 innings pitched. He's given up 11 runs on 15 hits, nine earned. Struck out 18, walked just three. Giving up five doubles, a triple, a homer, and five batters hit. He's got a 540 ERA. I mean, Scrag was in there not even long enough for me to get to his numbers. He walked one batter, and that was it. But I guess in a game that is close to getting away from you, Coach Shoup thought, let's get somebody in there who might throw a strike once in a while. And sometimes you run into that mentality in baseball. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And with, with series like this, with six total games to play against BCU and, and that whole mentality, you, you, you would light off the gas a little bit and maybe just say, well, you know, it we hadn't been our night at the play. We'll get it tomorrow. But a, a pretty gutsy mentality from Shoup to keep pulling guys until we find somebody that sells this game down because he clearly believes that his bats are good enough to overcome the four-run deficit with just a few innings to play. The batter will be Jose Gonzalez, who is one for three, grounded into a double play to end the first inning, flied out to left field in the fourth, and then singled in a run, singled in Rivera in the fifth, but was caught stealing to end the inning on the double steal. Ginther is a side-arming righty, and the first pitch is way low and outside. One and oh. Five straight balls thrown by this FAMU pitching staff. So side-arming lefty to side-arming side -arming righty. A little bit even a lower arm angle for Ginther. That time outside again to the righty Gonzalez 2-1-0. And again, the message from the, from the dugout has to be don't swing until he puts one across the plate. Because a walk here means another run for Bethune Cooking with the bases loaded and two outs. Vasquez on third, Rivera on second, Shun on first, the pitch, low three and O. Oh. And he, he's not got a lot of velocity, does Ginther. No, even for a side armor, definitely not much pop in that glove. Taking all the way here. The three O. Oh. Outside ball four, eight straight balls across two different pitchers for Florida A&M. Vasquez walks in from third, five nothing Bethune Cookman. As yet another bullpen arm starts to warm for FAMU, and, and and rather quickly from the looks of it, it's just a frustrating night to be a rattler. Nothing on either side of the ball has worked. Nobody has shown signs of slowing this one down yet. Here's Fabo, first pitch strike down the middle. And if you're Jorge Gonzalez, Fabo, who has been overly aggressive at the plate, trying to maybe just knock one out of here, this could be the chance to just sit on one of these slower breaking balls as he takes another strike right down the middle, low and two, and just get an RBI single in the gap. Fortunately for him, the first guy to really see a whole lot of fight from the pitcher. Can't work his way into a 
a hitter's count when the first two are fired in there from strikes. Base. Probably was told not to swing early coming into the A.B., but hasn't gotten him very far so far. Base is still loaded. The 0-2, two-out pitch. Fabo swings and misses at a breaking ball. Strike three, and that ends the inning. One run, one hit, three left, and we go to the eighth. Wildcats up five to nothing here at the Jack on Cat Eye Network Radio. Defensive change for Bethune-Cookman as we head to the top of the eighth inning. Wildcats have a 5-0 lead after plating another one and taking advantage of some Rattler pitching mishaps in that inning. Sergio Rivera has moved from center to right, replacing Gonzalez Fabu, who's out of the game. A.J. Smith is now in playing center field. First pitch to Hater Moda is a strike from Boca Bello, who is still in the game. How many pitches is Boca Bello up to now? That was 81 for him, so still got some left in the tank. Pitch 82 is a breaking ball that misses low, one and one. Two arms in the bullpen for Bethune-Cookman, starting to get some work in. First time we've seen them really get into a full-on warm-up. That one is laced to right field and deep. Going back, Smith, he can't make the play, and one hops the wall. Going to second is... Hater Moda, he will held up there. It's Hater Moda's second double of the contest. He has both FAMU hits today. And you know when A.J. Smith can't catch up to a ball in the gap, it's a true gapper as that one bounces to the wall pretty easily. Boca Bello's more than earned a little bit of lenience mm -hmm. out there on the mound, so well, they'll give him a chance. And both of Hater Moda's hits have been in the exact same spot in that right center field gap. But... Last time Hater Moda had a leadoff double, Bocabello struck out two to end the inning. So we'll see how he fares here with a leadoff man aboard. Of course, he's got the five-run lead as well. Jalen Niles, the batter, first pitch, breaking ball strike at the knees. Niles reached on an error in the second. That was the ball that was just dropped by Manny Soufran at first, but then was caught stealing to end the second inning. And then he struck out in the fifth. And he hits this one, a little blooper to a left field, and Rivera charges in to make the play, fires in to keep Hater Moda at second. Nice little piece of defense there by Sergio Rivera. Just a little too hard hit. Gave Rivera a nice chance to get under the ball, but got a good enough jump to get on what was a quickly sinking towards the turf. And maybe the wind helping that one a little bit, one straight out as it has been all night. One down in the inning runner on second here is Ben Kim. And Kim squares to bunt, drops a beauty right in front of the plate. And the catcher Rodriguez fires over to first for the out. It does advance Hater Motor to third on the sacrifice. And even with two out, one run, nice little momentum builder for Florida AM. Still just three outs to play with. Four total if you keep this inning in mind, still just trying to see something go across. Get a little bit of fire into a dugout that's been quiet just about all night. Here's the nine-hole hitter, True Fontenot. First pitch to him in the dirt. Nicely done by Rodriguez to prevent that going to the backstop. 1-0. Fontenot, only his third trip to the plate here in the eighth inning. Shows you how efficient Boca Bello has been. Grounded out in the third, flying out to right in the sixth. 
And that's a strike down the middle. Fontenot watches it go, and it's one and one. I'll catch trying to hold on to win this front end of a three-game series. Off the end of the bat, high in the air, first base side. Rivera squeezes it, and that'll end the inning. So for the second time in this ball game, Boca Bello works around a leadoff double by Adam Hader. Moda gets the other, everybody else to go one, two, three. One run, sorry, no runs, one hit, one left. We head to the bottom of the eighth. Wildcats look at a pad of five nothing advantage here at the Jack on Tadine Network Radio. We go to the bottom of the eighth and another new pitcher out of this Florida a and bullpen. This is Raylan Wagner, the graduate student out of Jacksonville. Formerly played in the SWAC at Alcorn State. Wagner, the righty's first pitch, misses inside to Manny Soufrain. So after a slow start offensively, the Wildcats played in four in the fifth and one in the seventh, there's a fastball strike down the middle. Soufrain doesn't offer out at one and one. And Soufrain got it started with the leadoff double to center field, and he came around to score to start the offense for the Wildcats of the fifth. Chop foul right at home plate, one and two. Now the bullpen down here for Florida a and has completely cleared out. It's pretty obvious they're going to rely on Wagner. No more quick hooks, no more one batter for this one. This is the guy to finish it off. Seventh appearance of the season for Wagner. He's gone seven and two-thirds innings. Here's a pitch. Soufrain rockets it down the first baseline. It's fair. It's going to go all the way into the corner. Bastardo tries to dig it out. Soufrain rounds second. He goes to third. Sliding in, he is safe. It's a triple for Manny as he lumbers around the bases. And this is the exact kind of oh we are getting some uh oh kind of, i think they're saying he may not have touched the bag at second oh no it's they're gonna call it a, i think a ground rule double because it hit a piece of the budweiser bullpen down the line and coach hernandez is going ballistic for now manny Soufrain is at third but as Soufrain was rounding second, I definitely saw the first uh, home plate, um, or sorry, the first base umpire put his hands in the air. But I'm guessing that it must have hit off the Budweiser bullpen that juts really close to that first base line, all the way down the first base line towards the wall. And and so Coach Hernandez's argument here isn't that it did not hit that part of the ballpark, but it's instead that it was communicated ahead of time that that is part of the ground rules here at the Jack. So we got some weird ones. There's that little chain link fence down the left field line. That's a ground rule double. If, if something goes over it. So now coach Shoop is going to come out and have a little bit of an exaggerated word with the officials, but 
For now, Manny Soufrain is on third base after apparently legging out a triple that went all the way down into the right field corner. We think the umpires may be calling it a ground rule double if it dug under the Budweiser bullpen. Of course, that's shielded from us down that first baseline of where we're standing. So we will see which coach gets his way. And the way Coach Shoup is arguing, it may look like this is a good of stand as a triple. And the, what, what Coach Shoup is saying that is the first base umpire put his hands in the air to signal that the play was dead, and he did indeed do that. He was right in front of us when he did. But I mean, from, from we've seen some weird things this week at the Jack. Yeah, of course, none is bigger than what we saw on Tuesday night with the out that was called out on the base pants. It was, it was but a he ball was we safe, was caught, but, the, but, but it, it wasn't was, caught. He was, was dropped, and then he went back to the base, then he went to the dugout, then went back to the base, and there was a big old conversation. But they're similar in, in, in the way that really the argument from both sides is, well, be consistent. It, with Coach Hernandez, it's be consistent. We talked about this in the pregame meeting. That's part of our ground rules. For Coach Shoup, it's, well, be consistent. You made the call. You have to stick with that call now. And so that's why we're continuing to see such an argument. He's very clearly putting his hands up. That's exactly the argument that he's making. Shoup is still... Now, it, it, this may be all semantics, right? It's the eighth inning of a 5 nothing game, and we're arguing between a double and a triple. But it's going to be a triple. And based on the relationship that I know Coach Hernandez and Coach Shoup have, two guys fairly close in this conference, especially during the move from the MEAC to the SWAC, guys who've in constant communication, there'll be no bad blood between the two of those guys. It very much can be just semantics in that way. But I think as we see another meeting at the mound here from Shoup, to get back to, you know, giving Manny Soufrain his praise for that hit, this is such a, a, a great night. Everybody coming in. The outfielders and the infielders, all nine players are going to meet on the mound with Coach Shoup as Manny Soufrain is on third base after a leadoff triple. How big has he been tonight? Absolutely. How big has he been all season? I mean, he, he's been a guy who's always looked the part of an intimidating hitter on the plate. Has always shown flashes of, well, there was a two home run game against Purdue Fort Wayne last year. He's always good for a, a double or so every series, but he has been a threat. The pitchers have gone away from him at the plate. He's being pitched away, away, away. So at the very least, He's leading to walks. He's led the team in that category. He's come through big to lead off innings. He's coming up with a double to get things started. He's been a guy who's kept the rallies going with RBIs. He really has been a revelation and a lock into the middle of this VCU lineup and a piece that really they haven't had consistently. They've had some streaky guys over the year, but Manny Subrain has been consistently dominant in the middle part of that plate. And, of course, maybe had the best moment of the year with that monster shot to dead center into the wind against Maine two weeks ago. It's just such a, a, a looming force that you can't work around. And he and he does so much more than that by protecting guys, like even a guy like Gonzalez Febo, who's still trying to figure it out at the plate. Well, when you have a guy like Soufrain behind you, you're going to get better pitches to hit. Well, Soufrain on third after the leadoff triple. Here's Jorge Rodriguez, singled in the second. And then was caught on the base pads in that inning. Fielder's choice reached in the fifth and then struck out in the sixth. And now he's in with the eighth, hitting in the eighth with nobody out and Suffrain on third. And the pitch from Wagner is in there for a strike at the knees and away. Sergio Rivera. Right, correction, um, Jose Gonzalez extended his uh, on-base streak to 18 games already tonight with that single in the fifth. Pitch, ground ball towards second. Greco has it goes off of his chest, but he fields it cleanly and underhands to first. And there's one down. Soufrain holds it third. And that's a moment where if it's not Manny Soufrain at third, maybe you try and send him home to try and beat the throw. Especially with, you know, the five-run lead. You just try to kind of put the pressure on and push it a little bit for FAMU. They've already shown a little bit of uncharacteristic errors. First pitch foul off of the leg of Ramsey's Cordova. Or did that hit his hand? Shook it off a little bit like it might have hit his hand, but he... Kind of went to swing, so it's not a true hit by pitch. Yeah, yeah, continues to shake off that right arm. Cordova, after the great night on Tuesday, of course, the home run on the game-winning RBI. Tonight, 
two fielders choices came around a score on the two RBI single by Garrett Chun in the fifth. And then, of course, struck out in the seventh. But Florida a and is on their fourth pitcher tonight. Granger started out, was pretty good up to the fifth inning when he gave up four runs, and then they used three pitchers in the seventh inning. Only gave up one. Williams, Scrag, and now, and then Ginther, and now, uh, Wagner. So, fifth pitcher of the night for FAMU, but as you mentioned earlier, Bryce, everybody except the starter, Granger, didn't really throw that much. They'll probably be in it. For the rest of the series, the pitch comes inside and hits Cordova. And will he take his base, or are they saying he swung at that? I think they're saying he swung at that, so that's a, a strike. And it's one and one. You clearly hit him on the shoulder. And as Coach Hernandez comes in to have a little bit of conversation with the officials again, very clearly still a little fired up from the last conversation. One thing I do appreciate about this Wildcats team we've seen early is, is Cordova is not going to be the guy that is – being fiery with the officials about a call he thinks went the wrong way. He's going to let his coach do that, which is a sneaky, I think, an important thing for guys like this. If your coach needs to get tossed, he uh -oh. felt it was right. I, I think Hernandez may be headed that way. He spikes his helmet down as he's arguing that Ramsey's Cordova was trying to get out of the way of the pitch, and it hit him on the shoulder. <laughs> coach Hernandez did not get tossed. He puts his helmet back on and goes back to third base. And Cordova's going to step back in with a 1-2 count. Respect the officials a little bit there. We've seen some lighter tossings, not this year, but certainly in our time here working games at the Jack. Hernandez has done enough to probably earn it for some, but we'll uh, get a little maybe warning and yep. head back to the third base box. Home plate umpire Don Andrews being... Very lenient with Coach Hernandez. That's two big confrontations. One about the triple. Did they, oh, did they call him out? So, I'm I'm not sure why that would be. Yeah, the count was only one and, and one. one. But here is Peter Vasquez up to the plate, and there's now two down and a runner on third. I'm not sure what happened there. Now we get left in the dust a little bit since we're out here in right field. We don't have constant communication that we can't really hear what goes on down there. But we'll get you that as soon as it comes across our wire. Foul ball straight back, 0-2. The count on Peter Vasquez, who's struck out in the third, but has two singles in the fifth and seventh and scored both times. So Cordova's does go in as a strikeout swinging, so the count must have been 1-2 and two when they ruled it a strikeout. Ground ball up the middle, chasing after it. Niles, and it gets past him and into center field. Soufrain scores, and it's an RBI single for Peter Vasquez. Six to nothing, Bethune-Cookman. And that's a really nice job. Third hit of the night for Vasquez. Just taking care of business. You know, picking up your guy who maybe thinks he got shorted a little bit in the last plate appearance. But you just do, do the job, bring the runner home, and continue to push it against FAMU. Now here's Colton Olison with Vasquez on first and two down, a situation he's been in twice already today. As the righty Wagner spin it a throw back to first. Olison 0 for 3 with two strikeouts and a soft line out to second base in the third, his only piece of contact on the day. Of course, Colton, much more to this team than what he is at the plate, swings and Pops it high in the air, foul, third base side, out of play. Of course, the defensive juggernaut that he is at second base, and of course, team captain behind the scenes. Kind of the mental leader of this team as a fifth-year senior. Olison ground ball towards the middle, positioned perfectly as Fontenot. He flips his second to end the inning. The Wildcats get another one. One run, two hits, one left, and we go. To the ninth inning, Wildcats three outs away from a series opening win here at the Jack. They lead it 6 to nothing on Cat Eye Network Radio.
to the ninth inning we go. And it's the top of the order for Florida A&M, down six to nothing. Ty Jackson leads it off, and Tanner Bocabello is going to go for the complete game here in the ninth. He's allowed two hits, both to Hayter Moda. First pitch, a strike at the knees, 0-1. That's such a refreshing thing to even be talking about in a ninth inning. It almost never happens in the modern baseball game. Bocabello misses low with the breaking ball that time, and it's 1-1. You f you figure even if this was a, a major league game, he probably would have been out two innings ago with the old third time through the order fascination we have nowadays. Bocabello misses outside and low to the righty Jackson two and one. I'm sure the hook's going to be pretty significantly short from Coach Hernandez here in the ninth. We do have a Wildcat warming up in the bullpen. Ground ball to shortstop. Cordova across the diamond one away. A pretty throw off of one leg from Ramsey's Cordova. That wasn't the easiest fielding job in the world. And it's it's the efficiency tonight that has been the winner for Bocabello. It's not it's not strikeouts. It's not anything dazzling necessarily, but it's been the efficiency. And uh, you know he's it, he's worked his defense so well. It's it's so critical. First pitch in there to Popple. Is a strike. And we're leaving the count up at one and one. Bocabello trying to be the first player for Bethune Cookman, we think, since last year to get a complete game as that one goes high, two and one. The count to Brody Popple. Who was it you said got the com complete game last year? Was it Gaviria? Gaviria had one early on in the season last year. I'll see if... Fouled straight back two and two. I'll see if Bocabello of, uh, gives us the time left in this game for me to try to research that quickly. One down on the ninth. Wildcats. A six to nothing lead in the first game of this series. Tanner stares down the barrel of the catcher. Fires. Ground ball towards short. Cordova fields. Cross the diamond. In time. Two away. Ramsey's Cordova perfectly positioned right behind the bag at second to make that play. And John Michael Pistardo is potentially last ups here for Florida A&M in the ninth. Breaking ball low, ball one. And then we got to mention again that he's only given up a hit to one person. The two doubles from Hayter Moda. That's it. Breaking ball, strike, check, swing. One and one. And it's really been that infield that has done a lot of the heavy lifting for Boca Bello. Just been outstanding all night long. Foul ball right above our heads here down the first baseline. That was, that was a bit scary. Yeah, that was a rocket. <laughs> As it cannons off the clubhouse behind us. Bocabello one strike away from a complete game shutout pitch. Ground ball towards third, diving past the glove of Vasquez and into left field for a base hit. Only the third hit of the game for Florida A&M. With an arm ready in the bullpen for BC, you figure maybe if that was a leadoff hit, you might have seen a little bit of a, a conversation had from Coach Hernandez. But yeah. Bocabello has absolutely earned the right, still just at 98 pitches. Well, if, if I'm Tanner Bocabello and I saw Coach Hernandez come out of the dugout, I'd be like, no, 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 no. You let, wave let him let off. That's the competitive this. nature. Absolutely. We He's earned it. We do have a pinch runner at first. Arjean Lynn, the redshirt sophomore from Tallahassee, is now playing or pinch running at first base. First pitch, a ball to Sebastian Greco. Greco's popped out to left field twice and then grounded back to the pitcher of the seventh. Bocabello deals. Big cut and miss. Nowhere close to that fastball one and one. I'm almost as nervous right now as I would be in a, in a tie game of the ninth. Just wanted to see Bocabello close this one out. There's a inside pitch. Thought he had the corner, but it's two and one now. I think Tanner's looking for that ground ball to get out of this one. It's been how he's made his hay tonight. No reason to go away. 
Breaking ball, low inside again, three and one. And I think if he walks Greco, there may be a conversation here with now two on for Florida a and Would be his first walk of the night. I think that's been a key to his success as well, is keeping guys off free passes. Foul ball, straight back, full count. The wind racing straight in Bocabello's face from behind the plate. That has to make pitching more difficult for everybody who's been on the mound tonight. Bocabello. Two down. The full count delivery. Runner goes high in the air. Left-hand side. It will go foul. Barely. Out of play. Full count now. That's a credit to Vasquez for even trying to make a run over on that. You see the shift from the Bethune-Cookman defense. You've got Col Colton Olison is... Only a handful of feet from the right field line. And Vasquez is the only guy on the left side of second base. Trying to get Greco to pull the ball. He does. In the air, first base side. It bounces. Olison to first. Safe. What a leg out by Sebastian Greco to get the infield single. I don't know. From our angle here, it looks like there may have been a shot that he was called out. But... It's that high hop that forced Olison to wait on it. Couldn't come in on it any more than he did. That leads to the infield single. Two on, two out, two singles. So in this ninth inning, the Rattlers have doubled their hit count, and here comes Coach Hernandez, and that might be it for Tanner Bocabella. I certainly would have to imagine Boca Bella will plead his case to stay on the mound. Sometimes we've seen Coach Hernandez come out with the, you know, with that attitude. You know, do you want to stay in this game? Is this your night? Boca Bella, if I know anything about this Wildcats pitching staff, is certainly going to request that he be given the chance, and it looks like he'll be afforded it. Yeah, but he's now over 100 pitches, right? We have another pinch runner on first base. Oh, no, Greco is, is over there. My apologies. I saw 30, it's 33, Greco's still there. And he will face Joseph Pirini. Pirini 0 for 3, two ground outs, one back to the pitcher in the second, one to third in the fifth, and a strikeout. First pitch, a huge hack and miss from Pirini. Big confidence building moment, as much as there can be in a 6-0 game for Boca Bella. You told your coach, this is my game, take it over, do your thing. The 0-1, breaking ball, doesn't find the zone. The entire Bethune-Cookman bench, all of them clad head to toe in that light blue alternate with the maroon cap. Cheering on Bocabello, ground ball to second. Olison flips to Soufrain. This one belongs to the maroon and gold. It's a complete game shutout for Tanner Bocabello, and the Wildcats take game one of the series six to nothing. And when you talk about a complete effort in a win, in a series opening win, this was a complete effort from the Wildcats. Defense was outstanding. The pitching will get to plenty of on the pitching. Bocabello, unbelievable tonight against a, a really good offensive Florida a and team. The bats did their job, put six runs on the board, nine hits, excuse me, that's 10 hits, taking advantage of Rattler's errors of Rattler miscues, making it miserable on every facet of the game for Florida A&M. Clearly a lot of frustration on their side throughout the game tonight. A very well-earned win and one that doesn't have a lot of holes if you're Coach Hernandez. A great setup to the weekend here at the Jack. Yeah. For the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats, six runs. On nine hits, they made one error and left five on base. For Florida A&M, no runs, four hits. Two errors, no, one error, excuse me. And they left one, two, three, four on base. The winning pitcher, of course, is Tanner Bocabello. He goes the complete game, gets a shutout, threw over 100 pitches, but... Even when there was two on in the ninth with two outs, you never really thought like anybody else was going to come in and take it from him. And, and I like the move by Coach Hernandez to come out for, before the last batter of the game and, and for nothing else, reassure his guy. I, I, 
you know when you come out to make that play, you know exactly what your starter is going to say. He's going to say, "Leave me out, coach. Like I, I, th- I earned this. This is my, this is my spot. Let me this opportunity." And, and I still like the move to come out, reinforce that from your guy, command excellence from him, and give him a chance to earn an outstanding complete game. That is likely your pitcher of the week. Boca Bello goes to three and zero. Oh, he will lower his already magnificent two ninety seven. ERA as Coach Hernandez will trot over here to join us on the Cat on Network post game show. The losing pitcher is Caleb Granger. He will drop to three and two, and his ERA of 270 will take a hit. And for a while there, as the rain right at final pitch, the rain started coming down hard. And I'm glad we got out of there when we did, because, and I'm also glad we're not, you know, in the open behind home plate and we're down here under the awning. But uh, I'm, I'm sure all the players are glad to not play for too much longer and be out here in this weather and go home, dry off, and be ready for tomorrow's game. It's picked up uh, pretty bad. Wind is really bad. It luckily let off for us for the whole night. It's going to be similar day tomorrow as we will bring on Coach Hernandez. We're now joined by Coach Johnny Hernandez here on the Cat on Network Post Game Show. Coach, I can't start anywhere else but Tanner Bocavello. First time in almost a calendar year with a complete game for this staff. Uh, how did you see it tonight? No, he did well. You know, he kept, uh, I mean, FAMU coming in. We knew that offensively they were pretty good. Um, and he did what he needed to do. Um, you know, got ahead of hitters, put guys away, and, you know, gave us an opportunity. That was a really good outing for Tanner. It was a stalemate between these two teams up until the fifth inning, and you finally got to Granger, yeah. aided by a couple of FAMU defensive miscues. And we, we talk a lot about this team punishing mistakes, and you did it again tonight. Yeah, they did it. I mean, first couple of innings, it was slow, um, you know, but then the guys settled in. I think it was that second, third inning. Uh, I think when we went the second time through the lineup, we saw better at-bats from our guys, and they took advantage of those opportunities. And, you know, Chun came up with the clutch double. Uh, there in that inning for us to go up three um, and the guys just kind of stayed persistent and did what they had to do and took care of what we needed to do on a Friday night in the ninth when Boca Bello gave up you know two straight little bloop base hits you came out to talk to him what went on in that conversation I I mean there was no doubt in my mind that he was going to finish this game it it was just more to settle him down you know not not let the moment get too big for him um, because we all knew right like we all wanted him to get the complete game but I just wanted to make sure that he just stayed in the moment um, just get the next guy. And that's what we preached our, to our pitchers and to our hitters, just the next guy, the next guy. And, and he stepped up for us. You know, that was a great way to start off the series. Um, but we have to come ready to play tomorrow because FAMU, obviously, the defending SWAC champs, you know, um, we can't take anybody lightly. So right now we're just punching the clock and get ready for tomorrow. How much did the weather play a factor tonight? Big wind whipping straight out towards center all night long. Rain off and on right at the end of the game. It started, you know, just bucketing down. Um, what did that do to the game tonight? I mean, I don't think it affected the game. I think going into it when I got here for BP, I thought we were going to have a high scoring game just based on obviously 16 to 20 mile an hour winds blowing, you know, out. But, um, you know, it it wasn't really a factor, in my opinion. Um, The guys just did what they had to do. We played besides, I think, that first inning or second inning, you know, defensively, we got better as the game got on. And and again, pitching defense and we took advantage of opportunities. Thank you, coach. Congratulations on the win. Good luck tomorrow. You got it. Hail Wildcats. Once again, your final score tonight from the Jack Bethune-Cookman. Six runs on nine hits, one error, five left on base. Florida A&M, no runs, four hits, one error, four left on base. For Bryce Wynoski and our entire Cata Network crew here at Jackie Robinson Ballpark, we'll see you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern for the College Basketball Invitational. One more chance for the basketball team to get out and play this season. They will play Arkansas State in the first round of the CBI. Hanson White and I will have that game from the Ocean Center. Then after that, we'll drive over here and have the second game of this series for you from the Jack between the Wildcats and the Rattlers. Game time of that one tentatively 6 p.m. We'll see what the weather does. Once again, your final score is 6-0. VCU takes the first game of the series. For Bryce Wineski and an entire Cat Network crew, we will see you tomorrow for a doubleheader here on the Cat Network. Have a good night.